This week we've been looking at James 1 uh, verse 19 where he gives us this threefold uh, injunction where he says that <clears throat> in our communication with other people we, we need to do three things that first of all we need to be um, quick to hear, be good listeners, we need to be, uh, secondly, we need to be slow to speak. And thirdly, we need to be slow to becoming angry. And the last two days I've talked about the issue of anger. I want to continue on with James, where in the next verse, in verse 20, he adds uh, commentary to this exhortation not to become angry quickly. He said, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. <clears throat> it's interesting that we often use anger as a default mechanism because there's nothing that can uh, motivate people to respond the way you want them to more quickly than to become angry with them. And unfortunately, um, many people use that as a way of navigating their life, and they end up really not having a lot of friends because nobody really enjoys being around somebody who is really angry unless they themselves share the same anger. But at some point, they'll begin to turn their anger on each other, and uh, there's kind of a predatorial cannibalism that takes takes place in many times relationships where people bite and devour as, as Paul warned in Galatians and they end up becoming consumed by one another. Uh, our, our society, America right now, is kind of in the midst of doing just that where we are a nation that's basically cannibalizing itself, tearing each other apart. And <clears throat> to a large degree, it's um, it's on one hand, you have people who have found that threatening and belittling and berating other people is a good way to shame them into doing what you want them to do, or at least to not get in your way and to keep quiet. On the other hand, there are many who are taking the bait and are reacting in exactly the same way. They're becoming angry and vitriolic and hateful towards the opposition. And a lot of that is, is motivated by fear. A lot of what pushes anger to the forefront is that we're afraid of what's going to happen. And it's the fight or flight mechanism that our first instinct is to run away from the problem or uh, anything we're afraid of. The second instinct is if we can't run away from it is that we're going to strike back. <clears throat> and you even hear people in the political realm talking about how that conservatives need to push back against the uh, progressive ideas that are being put forth. And I, I agree with that up to a point. I say that you need to speak up rather than uh, push back. You, you're just speaking up is a powerful pushback because oftentimes the other side doesn't really have good arguments uh, to defend their position. They Really what's needed sometimes in a conversation is for somebody to say, well, you know, I don't think I agree with that. Or, or please explain to me what that means. <clears throat> I find oftentimes people throw out these platitudes and if you press them and say, well, just can you explain to me what exactly that means? Uh, they usually <clears throat> go off in some rant that reveals that they haven't really given any thought, they're just having a, an emotional upheaval. And that's the kind of anger in particular that, that uh, James is warning about. I call it the emotional upheaval. And, and this is a, the passage that really began to force me to deal with my anger issues as a young believer because I realized that nothing good will ever come out of my anger. He told me right here, it doesn't bring about the righteous life, the life that's in right relationship with God. It doesn't bring me to that place, but it takes me to someplace else. And <clears throat> I find that, you know, anger is just super, super destructive. And that's why I think that when we uh, recognize anger rising in ourselves, I'm not saying that there's never a time to get angry. There are some things that are, are, are very disappointing. As we talked about in Ecclesiastes 7, he says, you know, surely oppression drives the wise into madness. And that's how we can feel about things when we see such rampant injustice. I mean, for me, and many of you know the, where I'm at, but just the whole issue of, of abortion, I find sometimes just drives me f to fits of, of frustration. And, and just, uh, it, it really, really drives me crazy. But the problem is <clears throat> getting upset and ranting isn't going to do anything. It, it really only is worthwhile if that motivates us to do something in a constructive way. How do we reverse the trend? How do we convince other people to think differently? And 
I tell you, for me, I find it's very gratifying when I have spoken about my feelings about this and how, as a Christian, we should view this and to see that it really has motivated many of our people to, to take very constructive action in suddenly being a voice uh, in a different way. I was, In fact, I was just talking to a, uh, a gentleman who owns a trucking company and <clears throat> has a lot of trucks, and one of the things he did is he, he put uh, these, st these uh, banners on his trucks on the front and the back and on the sides that simply said, choose life. And he said it's a great advertising because he says, you know, people who are on the highway, what are they going to do? They come behind you, they see it, they drive around you, they're coming the other way. They see it and you get to get your message out. It's such a simple thing. It's, it wasn't terribly expensive for him to do it, but it was a thing of saying, I take the issue seriously. What can I do to make a difference? And then God inspires us with, with great things. But when you just become angry, you don't become inspired to do anything except to act out your anger in, a, in an unconstructive and destructive way oftentimes. So it's, it's really, really important, I think, for us to understand that uh, anger can be uh, so counterproductive and it'll never lead us to the consequences that we really are trying to get to. So uh, as you think about it this weekend, I just really would encourage you to think about, first of all, to sit back and say, do I have an anger issue? If you're not sure, ask a friend or your husband or wife or even your kids, do you, do you think that I have a problem with anger? Uh, <clears throat> you may not like the consequence. In fact, the answer may make you angry, which will be a lesson. And they may be afraid to tell you. If you have a, a, a tendency to get angry every time somebody says something that you don't like, or you find you feel is critical, then <clears throat> they may be afraid to be honest with you. And there again, we've got this problem, don't we? we we're not having a, a meaningful in-depth relationship because you're not going to tell me what you really think because you're afraid of how I'll react. And in the end, you end up losing. It doesn't lead to the kind of helpful fellowship. Remember I quoted before yesterday about as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend out of, out of uh, Proverbs uh, 19. It's important that people will not sharpen the edge of your blade if they can't really kind of bring a little friction into your life. And I call that constructive criticism. I don't like being criticized. I don't even like being criticized when I deserve it, but I need it. And it's a discipline, again, we talk about in our life of learning to be able to receive uh, critical commentary from other people. I mean, <clears throat> in a, in a semi-public setting, the way I, you become kind of a public personality in, in a small way, um, that what happens is you find that a lot of people hurl criticism at you, and, and some of them it's totally unfounded, but not completely. And I always look for that, that grain of truth in the criticism. There's something in there that I need to hear, uh, otherwise it wouldn't bother me at all. And I think that there's always something to learn. So um, don't simply dispatch your critics as saying, well, that's ridiculous. It has no basis in reality. I often, I found that if I step back and say, maybe there's something to what they're saying. Let me think about that and pray about that. And oftentimes when you do, the Lord opens your eyes to areas of where you need to address and grow. So I hope this is helpful for you. Um, I've been kind of long-winded this week. I, I hope it hasn't been wasted. I don't especially I hope I haven't wasted your time. But uh, look forward to getting together with you again next week. Many blessings. Bye-bye.